Amid the chaos of war, it is easy to forget the individual experiences of the soldiers. The Vietnam conflict was so polarizing, they returned home to a public that had turned against them. This film gives them a voice that has been silenced for too long. These are the soldiers of Vietnam. When I was 17 and my uh, high school counselor said, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I said, I want to be a high school uh, phys ed teacher. He said, well, I don't think that that's going to work because you're going to need two languages. So he said, I think maybe you ought to consider the military. So on March 20th of 1962, three days after I was 17, I joined the Naval Reserve. I went to hospital corps school, uh, AKA uh, learn how to be a medic. And I got orders to Long Beach, California to a ship that only went to sea two weeks a year. I said, yes. Now you gotta remember at that time, it was surfing beach boys and California girls. And I was ready. What's not to love? Until the 11th of April of that year, I received orders from the ship, the USS Isle Royale, to the USS Berkeley, which was tied up alongside. She was beautiful, brand new. It's like looking at a brand new Corvette. It had firepower, it was fast, it was right up my alley. So I asked the doctor who was my boss, I said, where is it going? He says, oh, you'll like it. It's going to Hawaii, going to Japan and Hong Kong. He didn't say Southeast Asia. But I was only 18 and ready to go, so I signed on. I designed the Bell Helicopter Antennas, the VOR loop antenna, which we called, I called the towel bar, on the back of the helicopter, and on the top of the helicopter was called the shark fin. In the monsoons, when you don't, can't see, or at night, you know, these antennas basically told you the height where they were. I was drafted. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. You know, I had a top security clearance. And, uh, but at that time I was, I wouldn't say I was gun ho I just didn't know what it was about. I'd like to find out. I'd been in college and uh, was doing all right, but I thought a truly mediocre job. And um, it was very expensive. And I thought I was wasting my money and my parents' money at the time. So I, uh, I joined the Marine Corps, much to the chagrin of my uh, mom and dad. Mom and dad were both in the Marine Corps. I decided that uh, if they could do it, I could do it. And I wanted to test myself, so off I went. I, mean, I volunteered under duress. I was in college. And my dad is a, is a veteran of the Second World War. And uh, in 67, 66, 67, this whole war was really exploding and the draft was expanding and expanding. And he was very adamant that he wanted me to go in as an officer. So he, he made it my, worth my while to uh, graduate with an ROTC, as an ROTC lieutenant and ultimately I, you know, love him for that and hate him for that, for, for what happened to us. But uh, that's how I got into it. Um, after graduation in 67, from college in 67, I spent a year working for IBM, hoping the war would be over <laughs> by the time uh, I had to report for duty. Uh, I was artillery trained, got over there as a uh, second lieutenant, and then they made me first lieutenant as soon as I hit country, basically. And then uh, by the time I got out of the service, I was a captain. My job primarily, for did a lot of jobs, but the longest job was a foreign observer attached to the infantry. You know, so I said, I want to learn as much as I can. I volunteered for as many courses as I can. I took demolition course so I can say, well, what? You know, if I got to go over there, I want to know what to do. You got to go into a situation. You got to learn and do as learn as much as you can, and become as physically fit as you can. I was sent to Panama to jungle school, 
which was an interesting experience, and it was uh, a good experience because the two and a half weeks in Panama counted as Vietnam time. So you were in the jungle, but you weren't getting shot at. <laughs> so that worked out well. When I was sent to Vietnam, I had less than nine months left in the service. At the time, um, we had virtually no um, warning. I was actually in a different battalion, 3rd Battalion, 13th Marines, in, uh, at Camp Pendleton in California. And we were awoken one night at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we t were told that we were going to be on our way to Vietnam by 5 o'clock in the morning and not to contact anybody. So we were there to support the 3rd Battalion, 27th Marine Regiment, which was the grunts that were out here in front of us. I was a, a team leader on a gun team and uh, loaded onto the helicopters, got out to our uh, search and destroy. I was a grunt. Basically, we humped the boonies, chased Charlie, had numerous combat assaults. This was when the uh, first cab was going air mobile. Well, it was a hospital corpsman also known as my nickname, Doc. Uh, I was one of two people that took care of 350 men on the Berkeley. My services were open 24-7. I was a counselor for the guy who got the Dear John letter. Maybe the, the guy was drinking shaving lotion because we were out to sea for so long. People would get burned. People would would get their fingers crushed handling ammo when we were in a firefight or whatever. I'm very proud to say that nobody died on my watch. Gradually, uh, as the year goes on, and if, you know, as, as you survive and get more experienced, you get closer and closer to the rear. You start out in the deep woods, and then you end up, uh, as I did, as uh, a battalion ammo officer for a couple weeks before I rotated out of country. But the major bulk of it was a forward observer with the infantry. A forward observer, what we did basically is basically go out hunting. We'd uh, go through the jungle all day long. My job was when the infantry got into a firefight, depending on the situation, I would be calling in artillery, directing uh, the gunships, the helicopter gunships, fighting them with the artillery and with the uh, helicopters in every firefight. They kept moving us around to get contact. Actually, when I finally figured it out, we weren't really attacking. We were actually the, the carrot, which was dangled in front of the Vietnamese so that they would attack us, and then we would be able to bring in artillery on them. So we were just like, at that point, we understood that we were just cannon fodder. Just before I was supposed to leave, I was in, back now in battalion. I had to spend several nights up in the fixed wing, you know, uh, as opposed to helicopter. This is like a, a Piper Cub, of all things. Actually, I was, we were in Cambodia at the time, uh, flying these things. And uh, they said, go up and you know, shoot at anything you could see. You could see crap. You know, I was talking to the pilot. He could figure out what we were doing up in the dark, dark night, you know, just shooting at things, what you know, you think is a road intersection or something. He said, what the hell are we doing up here like this? And then afterwards, you know, uh, I'm, I'm back stateside. I see President Nixon saying, we're going into Cambodia and everything. I'm saying, what a liar. I was there last week. <laughs> but it dawned on us, I think uh, we were up, you know, up there and to see if we drew fire from the ground. So if we drew fire from the ground, then they, we knew the bad guys had large forces, you know, on the border of Cambodia or inside of Cambodia. The first tour was uneventful until you might know it as the Gulf of Tonkin incident. There seems to be some controversy as to whether it happened or not. The Berkeley was part of the flotilla that was involved. Take it from me, it happened, not just once, but it happened twice. I came home, and a neat thing happened. The Stars and Stripes newspaper showed President Johnson signing the GI Bill. 
to go to college was going to be expensive. I needed six more months to get full coverage under the GI Bill. You know what I did. Signed on for a second tour. Why not? It was a brand new ship. Part of it was air conditioned. The only problem was you'd be out to sea for two months straight. So this tour became very eventful because our job was to retrieve pilots that had already bombed the north but had been hit and were asked to try to get to the open water. And we had to retrieve them. There is many times that we came across a life raft would die in the water, a light on, an antenna, no pilot. I still remember seeing that a, a number of times. The one time that we went in during the day, uh, we got caught in between two islands. There were two pilots in the water. Some helicopters went in to try to get them. They were shot in. There were a total of eight guys. We finally got uh, six of them out. But in the interim, uh, we got hit. That doesn't hold a candle to what my comrades on the ground experienced. By the time I went through the situation, we got, I got wounded numerous times. I got a round that went through my neck here, and it stuck back next to my carotid artery. Then the other wound is on my chest right in here. Which, when I sent to Cameron Bay, I said, well, I'm going to go home. No way. I go, well, that's, that's surprising. You mean I'm going to be healed up and they're going to send me back out? Oh, yeah. And which, hap which that actually happened. What actually got me out of combat was the fact that my eardrums were, were blown out. So that basically got me out of combat. The wounds in. After I was wounded the fourth time, I was sent down to Benoit as cadre. I used to teach people how to come in, how to deal with weapons, zero their weapon, basically how to survive the heat, what to wear, what to use, how to go through it, how to deal with it. All right, in the first picture is a beautiful picture of the Mekong Delta. The rivers were a source of fish, fish were a source of protein, and protein was extremely rare in Vietnam. We used to fish all the time, and uh, what you do is you take the hand grenade, you throw it in the water, and the fish would all come up. You take, scoop them out, you put a stick on it, and you eat them. It was great eating. Swans. Wow. They appear to be in the wild. I'm surprised somebody hasn't eaten them yet. If not them, us. When I went to Vietnam, I was 5'9", 172 pounds. When I came home, I was still 5'9", but I was 132 pounds. We ate everything that walked, crawled, and breathed. And that swan looks good. We had food dropped to us by parachute. We, we were carrying packs after we got resupplied. Our packs were you know, about 50 pounds for the first day. First day you drank a lot of water to just to eat up the stuff. Uh, but boy, they were heavy. We didn't have hot meals. I had probably count on two hands how many hot meals we actually had. I remember going for one stretch for 75 days, 75 days without a shower or a hot meal. Uh, just a helicopter coming in every three or five days to resupply us and then they would take off. We would be on our own and uh, for various reasons we couldn't rotate back to give our guys a little R&R, &R, a little rest, a hot shower and stuff like that. I can only give you the naval perspective as, as far as rescue at sea, fire support from sea, uh, observation from sea. We'd be going through a rice paddy or a bill, and you'd see a seven, eight-year-old boy or girl riding on a water buffalo with a stick, smacking them in the ass, and off we go, go here, go there. And this tiny little person is, is riding this beast, primary source of labor for them. Never saw a tractor once in Vietnam. The only experience I have with water buffalo is that I, I've seen it in, in National Geographic. As a matter of fact, this is like a National Geographic lesson. 
when going through uh, bills such as this, um, I never spoke Vietnamese, not in our area of operations or AO. We found that uh, I could learn a great deal more by simply listening and having them feel that we couldn't understand rather than me uh, interrogating someone or asking them questions. These are clearly Army helicopters, big, beautiful beasts. The basic helicopter was the Huey. I've got more time in helicopters. I, I think I earned three air medals in Vietnam. You know, most pilots don't even collect some of that time. Choppers, when I see those, I think of medevac. I think of, hey, here comes the chopper. Uh, we're getting mail. Vital part of the service. I don't know how the Marines and the Army did it without, you know, some type of uh, communication with home. My one experience on a helicopter landing, I hate heights. And I was holding on so tight that my fingernails and cuticles were bleeding. Being with the first calf, spent a lot of time in the helicopters. And so I saw a lot of the country, a lot of three corps uh, from the air. And these pictures are, you know, very uh, reminiscent, jogs a lot of memories here. I'm sure others can speak to it better than I, but they were awesome to see with the miniguns opening up and looked like a, a dragon licking, licking the ground. What was it, every fifth round was a, was a tr tracer, yet it looked like a solid orange sheet hitting the ground. And from what I read, they could put a round in every inch of a football field. Boy, I'd hate to be in the bottom of that. How we use the helicopters typically is we would do uh, what's called a combat assault. And I think I experienced maybe about 35 of them. Battalion operations that set up a rig of fire. It's amazing we didn't kill ourselves with this. If this little box was the field, they would have the artillery coming in all around the field crushing all the bad guys, theoretically. And the helicopters would come down and land. Everybody would jump off and the helicopters get get out of there as fast as they could. We're hovering at about, I don't know, eight, 10 feet. You got 50 pound pack on your back, rifle and ammo load, and they say, jump. I said, jump. He said, yeah, there might be mines down there. We don't want to land on it. I said, let me, you don't want to land that, but I can jump on it. So uh, that, didn't endear me to them too much, but I guess I understand. Well, we landed in a patty, as fate would have it. And to this day, I don't know whether it was patty juice or Paul juice that got my pants wet because I was scared to death. Combat assaults really puckered you up. The first time you do those things, and sometimes the second and third time you do those things, um, you have to overcome those things. And sometimes you just say, oh, shit and you do it anyway. We also had, had a lot of fun with uh, the chopper pilots, especially with officers that had to be transferred and that we didn't exactly have a, a liking for. We would call the chopper, and I was on the chopper detail. Of course, medic is always called, you know, to be there. The chopper couldn't land, but he would drop a line and they would put in like a, a tire tube that you would put under your shoulder. And we'd tell the, tell the chopper pilot, we don't like this guy. Could you reel him up real slow? So as the chopper would take off, here's the, the officer like this. The chopper's over here, and he's on a, a line over here swinging in the breeze. And eventually, you know, they're winding him up and, say, and we're going, see ya. We didn't have helicopters for all the guys, for all the guys that, that shoot the guns. And the picture here of a jeep with a bunch of guys, and, and this is how we would go back and forth. And it was an unsecure area, and we didn't have, you know, people protecting us. We didn't have air cover. We didn't have all the things. So we would drive these jeeps as fast as we could <laughs> just to get back into Dana. And, and I remember, you know, almost killing ourselves with these stupid things. We had to be careful going down the road in jeeps. A lot of the guys in motor transport, well, they went over as kids and they drove like crazy people when they were kids. They grow, drove even crazier when they were in Vietnam. The general thought was, if you go over a mine real fast, it's going to blow the back of the 
the vehicle off, and you might survive it. That and guys, young guys like to drive fast anyway. But I wouldn't go on anyone's vehicle. I wouldn't go on an army personnel carrier. I wouldn't go on a jeep. All I want to do is come home. So I would walk. I'm in no rush. Let me get to where I got to be. Let me protect myself by w walking in the jungle. I wouldn't walk on the roads. If you went where there wasn't a trail, you knew there wasn't a booby trap. So I would tell my guys, let's chop our own trails. You know, and I remember my, my helmet was filled with sayings. I kill a commie for mommy. I know I'm going to heaven because I spent my days in hell. That's what some of the things that I put on my helmets. Some of the funniest things I've ever read in my life have been on helmet covers or the wall of four holers. You're saying now, some of these guys couldn't tie their shoes without help, yet they come up with these, these comments and sayings that were just incredibly brilliant. It was a reason why you put it on your helmets. The sniper, a Vietnamese sniper, would, wouldn't shoot the guy that looked scrungy. The guy that looked clean and neat, was dressed clean and neat, he'd shoot him. So I would make sure that I sometimes grew a beard or had a goatee, and I had more stuff on my helmet, and I'd look like, he's a grunt. Don't shoot him. Shoot the guy in front. He's probably the guy in charge. Shoot the officer. That was a, one thing that I, I used in my own head to keep myself alive. That they f had found out that they would be looking for guys with rank or officers or whatnot, so we never wore any rank. There's a picture of Vietnamese children, you know, like we, we tried to stay away from them because the Viet Cong uses them against us. What they would do is give them a sandbag and put a hand grenade in the stand, sandbag. And what they would do is tell them that when they get in between, a bunch of GIs pull the pin on the hand grenade. Whenever we would go into a port and a child would walk into, say, a, a saloon or a bar or whatever, everybody would get nervous because, you know, it, it's the unexpected that could happen. The Vietnamese kids were cute as long as, you know, you could trust them. They, they would be always running up to you asking for cookies and sea rations and whatnot. You know, I'd always give them whatever I had. We had the uh, tropical chocolate. You know, how could you treat a kid bad? Really nice people, really, for the most part, very, very, very nice people. This guy was in pain. We were out to get a pilot at night. We were in radio silence. Uh, he kept getting worse and worse and worse. I packed him in ice. I figured that he probably had appendicitis. So here's this guy in his bunk with ice packs all over because I had to get him through the night. And he was saying, Doc, I, it's, I'm so cold. I said, listen, I'll make you a deal. You get through the night and I'm gonna get you out of here on a chopper in the morning, and you're going to the carrier. And you know why you are, this is gonna be motivational for you? Bob Hope and Ann Margaret are there. And he said, Ann Margaret, he wanted more ice. I've written um, Ann Margaret Smith uh, two or three times and told her, whether you know it or not, you saved a guy's life because he wanted to see you. And Maybe, maybe you could send him a picture or something. But like I said, nobody died on my watch. We hired some of the, uh, the small groups going around, but uh, we never saw any of the big shows. Oh, Bob Hope. Thank you, Bob. Hello, Joey Heather. Her brother was a DJ in Hartford, Dick Heatherton. He didn't look like that, though. A lot of guys there for that show. Good for them. Good for them. I'm hoping that the guys that saw it were guys from the bush. I never saw Bob Hope over there. I'd have loved to see him. I never got to see Bob Hope. <laughs> we were so far back in the weeds, we never uh, got in to see those shows. This appears to be a guard shack near a major compound. 
I'm guessing this was some type of major base. A lot of Vietnam had a lot of mountains, and that was more up north. As I say, I was, you know, further, further south. Thank God of all my walking through the jungle, virtually no hills. Thank God. <laughs> but if you'd get up on these, on these hills, and my only experience there was going up with, a, uh, with an FO, a forward observer. Sometimes you would wake up very wet from the dew in the clouds. You would be, you'd be in a cloud, which was beautiful and terrifying because I mean, the only thing you could do would be to hear them. And um, your, your vision was useless at that point in time. Fortunately, I never had to face an assault from something like that. But that doesn't mean that you weren't frightened about it. And most of the fear that I experienced there was not during a firefight or a, a rocket or mortar attack. It was thinking that you were going to get in a firefight, thinking that you were going to get in a mortar attack. My first night on, on guard duty there, every bush moved. Every bush was a person. It was an experience. You get over it pretty quick, but I think you have to experience that first to move on. For about a week after I got out to the fire base, I found myself slow, not, you know, not reacting well to as quickly as to things as I should have. I noticed that things weren't right, and things didn't become right until I accepted the fact that I could die. I hadn't really thought about it. Well, you joined the Marine Corps, you asked, what do you think? But saying that at uh, Huntington Beach is one thing, and saying that on Hill 34 was entirely something else again. I wasn't fatalistic to the point of saying, I'm going to die here. But I had to accept the fact that I might die here. And once I did, then my training, my physical training, my military training, whatever common sense I had um, kicked in, and I was much more effective. And I, I felt I did a, a better job and perhaps was a better leader because of it. There's a common thread between all the services, discipline and risk. And we all at one time thought we would die. I had a lot of lucky breaks. I was in the, on the fire base and uh, it was called the TOC, the Tactical Operations Center, which was a bunker that where all the radio communication, all the coordination was going on, coordinating all the choppers coming in and out. It, it's and it's under uh, thousands and thousands of sandbags and metal and what. That's a pretty, pretty safe place. And uh, and I remember just walking, you know, across the room. And on the far wall were the RTOs, the radio te uh, telephone operators, and they're working on the radios. And uh, a, uh, a rocket hit right above them. And everybody in the talk w w had suffered some kind of injury, except me. And because I was walking and walked past a beam, a 12 by 12 beam, and that was between me and the rocket. And I walked away without a scratch. The RTOs. The radio guys didn't make it. We used to count the days, you know, 24 days and a wake up before we get out. That's how you lived. Oh, I only have 23 days left. Every day you get up and you hope that when you get in the helicopter, you're going to make it. I was, we were shot down. I was shot down twice. We flipped over in, in the paddy, rice paddy dikes. When we would try to pick up a pilot, it's a little known fact that the North Vietnamese would be paying a bounty, would get a bounty for an American pilot. And I don't know how 
these people even dared to go 25, 50 miles out to sea, but they would go out in flotillas of, you know, maybe 40, 50 boats, just waiting to hear the plane and watch where it crashed, because that was the objective for the pilot. Get off the mainland and get to the water, and he had a better chance of surviving. A lot of pilots lived, but they're not around. But I doubt very much that all are deceased. This might be a fantasy, this might be a hope, but it could be a reality. It's probably Tonsonut Air Force Base. This appears after a major attack, if not rockets and mortars, a ground attack with uh, damaged phantoms. Must have been being during or one of the major attacks, I'm seeing guys prone in the grass outside a major installation, so that they're waiting for the bad guys to show up. What's worrying me is there are five guys laying in the grass and another two or three right behind them. I don't want somebody shooting over my head from behind me. The guy's only five feet behind them. Getting into it. I like the prone position. I don't like standing up and shooting. I guess you do what you have to do. Very few people know what the Navy really did. We would get called by the guys on the ground and say, hey, you know, these are the coordinates. Knock them out for me so we can move forward. There's a picture here. Of, uh, I believe it looks like a, uh, a Navy jet. These guys were terrific. Uh, when we got to use them uh, a few times, they said I, I got to use them because I would be in contact with them, directing their fire. And boy, they were terrific. Just unbelievable. They'd come over us at God knows how many mi hundred miles an hour. But I tell you, they, they could pick a bird out of a tree if they wanted to. They were absolutely incredible. The Navy had eight-inch guns they could sit seven miles out to sea and put a round in a bucket. That's an exaggeration, but not much. They were extremely accurate. C-130s and dropping uh, Agent Orange. One of the early sprays, apparently, because the jungle area below it is all still has all its foliage. They were, there was a campaign on, like, why fight them in the jungle? Let's just eliminate the jungle. And they would defoliate hundreds and thousands and thousands of acres. Nobody knew any better. We walked, we walked through it. The Vietnamese have to live with that. So it's one thing, you know, we're living with it, but they have to, they're still there living with it. My only experience with Agent Orange is what I might be exposed to. I'm, I'm a blue water sailor. Airplanes came back, flight after flight, mission after mission, covered with the gooey glop, and they had to clean them and work with them and all that, and yet they're denied assistance and coverage. The planes would come back, and they had to clean them on their ships, on the aircraft carriers, and I never even thought about that. Any residual from orange, whether it was in the water or in the air, uh, especially in the water, because the ship never shut down. It always had to be ready, even in port. The boilers were running, or if we were at anchor, the boilers would be on. Now, what does a boiler do? Sucks in the water, purifies it for, you know, the, for the ship. So eventually, if there was orange in the water, and Da Nang certainly was, it's like the third uh, largest concentration, uh, we were sucking it up, and we were exposed. They used to give us tank sprays to spray the green line, which the green line is the outside perimeter, so nothing would grow there. So the Vietnamese couldn't sneak in on a perimeter. The sprayer part, you would press down, would drip onto your, your finger, and that finger constantly peels. The Agent Orange caused that. I walked through a, a fair amount of Agent Orange cleared areas. Fortunately, uh, I, I guess it was enough time had passed, enough rain had knocked it all down. 
so far in my life, I've been fortunate enough to have dodged that bullet, and I'm grateful. The Agent Orange, horrible disease. You know, I got prostate cancer, and I'm a diabetic from this. My daughter was born with uticaria pigmentosis, which is too many white blood corpuscles in the epidermis of the skin. How did my daughter catch Agent Orange from me? Well, they did. It's passed on through their genes. It's, you know, so that's a horrible situation. Hopefully, uh, you know, my daughter's children don't show up with it. You know, what I find is the hardest point was coming home. You know, you just want to get home. You know, we called Vietnam, you know, Vietnam, and we called the United States the world. We're coming back to the world. And in coming back to the world, when I came back in San Francisco, you know, we were treated as the baby killers. And the protesters in the airport would spit on us. And that was a rough situation, you know, coming home. Their theory was we were doing something wrong. Well, I just went over there to did my job. I was only drafted for two years. I came and did my job, and I wanted to come home and not be bothered. I was hoping that it would be accepted. We weren't. No. I got back uh, stateside in uh, 70, uh, in around April and May of 70. And I remember being with a buddy of mine, and uh, we were driving, going to a party or a bar or something like this, and we ran into a, a march, a protest against the war of Vietnam. And, you know, I'm, I'm only back about 10 days, <laughs> 10 days. And I can remember the, uh, the kids, the young people, uh, coming up and, you know, we're trying to move slowly, like two miles an hour through the crowd because they enveloped us. And they started pounding on the car and whatnot. And uh, I mean, I, I came this close to losing it. I just want to hit the accelerator and just plow through them. <laughs> you know, God forbid I would do that. You know, seeing these people protest things and they didn't realize what our kids what our kids went through. So I was flying home uh, out of LAX, Los Angeles International, and I'm going through the terminal, and because I was flying military standby, which was about half price, which was the only thing I could afford, I was in uniform, and I wasn't ashamed of anything I'd done. I'm no hero, but I'm clean and neat. And. Uh, this young woman and a couple of her friends came over and started giving me a ration of poop. And I'm there, I'm not bothering you, leave me alone. And she comes out with this plastic bag full of yellow stuff, yellow liquid. And I said, don't even think about it. Well, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm telling you, don't even think of it. And a cop came over and moved him away. I go to my seat and there's this uh, lady had the middle seat. Next thing I know, she's calling for the stewardess and insisting that her seat be changed because she wouldn't sit next to me. I remember getting off the ship on November 22nd of 1966, uh, and I was ready to go home. Not this is been shared with a whole lot of people. And some of the things that I'm about to say, it's the first time in like 50 years that I can admit it. But when I came back, I was really fucked up. I had started to talk in my sleep. My mother would say that I would get up and walk. Uh, I had, she had to keep my bedroom door closed because I would just get up and walk around. I'd be totally asleep. I can remember one time I was driving on Route 7 uh, to go to work in the emergency room uh, for my 11 to 7 shift. And I was like 10 minutes on the road and I'm going, oh my God, I'm driving. The women in my life have been very cordial to my, what I would call delicate condition. Uh, my first wife, funny story, said uh, two weeks after we were married, 
She said, I'm very happy that you told me about the girl you met in Australia because last night you told me all about her. My present wife um, has been very kind to me. Uh, I have, I, I go through periodic forms of depression. I try to cover it with humor. Then getting back to my local town, I went into the local bar, which is called the Deer Range. I would go in there with my dress greens, my, my I had all my medals on, I had my jump boots on, my Cochrane jump boots, and I thought I was the greatest thing in the world. Had to be 100 people in the bar. One person made a comment, and the one person says, who's the fag with the beret on? I had to go up to him, grab him by the throat, throw him into the bar, finished my seven and seven, went home and took my uniform off and never wore it again. Well, the guy at the bar ended up having a, a, a neck problem and a, a nose problem, and uh, he was sent to Southside Hospital. The police came to my house the next day and said I had no right to touch anybody. Nobody saw anything, though. That's the one thing. There was nobody saw anything. And he, and he goes, he doesn't know what happened, so there was no charges ever filed. But, you know, with my training, I should have never done it. And I just never did after that again. Then I got home, and uh, my family and friends met me warmly, even my draft dodger friends met me warmly. Life was pretty good until embarking on uh, my professional life. It did hinder uh, my potential growth professionally for a number of years, particularly in the getting started years when you needed a break going into your first level of management and that sort of thing. I worked for a year almost with IBM before I went into active duty. So I didn't have the trauma of, of finding a job when I came back. I could get right back into IBM and did what so I didn't have that problem. I was very fortunate in, in many respects. So for about 25 years when I, after getting out of the service in Vietnam, I, I had very little to do with any of the service organizations or, or that. I was no, no longer proud of what I did. You know, that was very emotional for me. In the last 23 to 25 years, I've been quite active, but it took time. I had to adjust my way of thinking when I was ready to do it. I still get flashbacks every now and then, you know, not, not so much now, but, you know, some of the descriptions I, I mentioned, you know, I haven't thought about in, in, in decades. My focus was on trying to catch up on the four years that I lost. If you look at the time frame, the guys and girls that I graduated with had already graduated from college and were working. I had to condense that work and school at the same time. And what I did is I worked from 11 to 7, the graveyard shift at the hospital. And then I would go to school from 8 to 2 and I did that for four years, trying to get back or at least catching up with the kids that I, that I once knew. But, you know, let's, let's just revert back, you know? And when I was in that counselor's office, he said, you can't go to college because you don't have two languages. Well, I got through. A week before I graduated, though, I was told by the dean that I was not going to graduate because I didn't pass my student teaching. During one lesson, I talked about Vietnam. And I knew that my supervising teacher, so I found out, was against the war. So I got the bad evaluation. I told the dean, when you die or retire, I'm coming back 10 years later. I had to wait, but I graduated and I eventually continued my career in teaching. But I worked my ass off. And I'm very happy that the Navy taught me to do that. I'm sure that a number of guys, the two million or so that, that went to Nam, have experienced something similar, if not even worse. And at least now when young men come back from Afghanistan, in Iraq, there's help available. But you gotta remember, in the 60s, we had to keep it all to ourselves. 
because nobody would listen. When I went up to Albany and they inducted me into the Veterans Hall of Fame, but I was up there with people that deserved it a lot more than I did. I said, geez, you're from the Battle of the Bulge, World War II, you, you guys really seen some shit over in Bastogne. We talked a lot and I said, this brought my whole, whole life changed at that point because I said, I, I gotta do more. I ended up selling my 100 acres in Middle Island and I said, well, I wanna do something to help our veterans. I met Frank Amafatado at Beacon House and I bought uh, numerous houses for him to put veterans in. And, uh, you know, I see that veterans can work together. Basically, that's what my whole goal is to help out our veterans and help out the veterans that are coming home from Iraq and overseas and Afghanistan that, that need the help and why they are committing suicide. You know, there's a tremendous amount of guys out there that are committing suicide. They didn't do anything wrong. I think that's, that's what the problem is. You know, these guys did their job, just like I did. Every guy that went to Vietnam put his life on the line, whether it was on the ground or on the water or in the air. I think all of us did one hell of a job when we had to follow the rules of war at that time. Uh, <clears throat> not to say that I'd do it again, but I'm very proud to have done it. It's so much better now, and, and I, I applaud it because that was a big, big weak, weakness, how uh, our troops are treated, especially for the families where their sons did not come back. I mean, the extension of how they must feel that my son lost his life over there or came back with missing limbs or missing eyesight, uh, you know, just to be despised for what he did, almost. The Vietnam experience, once you have it, it's like a freckle, it doesn't leave. The uh, experience was the experience, I guess. I uh, went over there thinking that I was saving the world. My experience, my experience was, was good, scary. We used to say, uh, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to do, to do this. But then again, we, we would trade it in for a million dollars. The uh, experience with my brothers and uh, everybody over there was a maturing experience. Vietnam not only gave me an education financially with the GI Bill, but it gave me the real definitions of a couple words. Friendship, love, camaraderie, and country. I leave you with that. As a teacher, I'm hoping that your audience has learned something that they didn't know before. And I'm very proud to have been able to tell you this. God bless America.